Anakin's not excited to go home because, again, like we discussed, when he was just a asshole psycho in the live action movies in Attack of the Clones, he goes back to Tatooine to go find Shmi, his mom. And when in this Clone Wars movie, when it does a transition to Tatooine, the Force theme plays, and then we hear uh, a yell of a Tusken Raider. <laughs> And you're just like, ooh, yikes. Last time Anakin was here. I killed them. And not just the men, but the women and the children, too. That's the scene that jumped the shark, man, for Anakin. And I slaughtered them like animals. He slaughtered them all. The women and Even children. the women and children. I hate them. I slaughtered all of them. What is going happen, everybody? I stole that from another YouTube channel, one of my favorites, and one of my personal heroes, Nolan North voice actor actually uh and this week we are uh, we are watching a movie that will feature a lot of voice actors and happy may the 4th or may the 3rd because we come out on wednesdays but it's star wars week at just play it may the 4th be with you my friend i am james i'm nick and i didn't prepare a, a jedi name for me but i'll just say jimmy Wan jenobi i will be count Chocula. Guys, this is exciting stuff. We are entering the Star Wars universe, and this is going to be a pretty hefty one. This is the first movie that we're reviewing that's part of these very vast, expansive cinematic universes. Now, we do have our, our bootleg dollar store NCU that we are going to tape all these forgotten Marvel movies together and make our own cohesive universe of reviews but this is our legitimate first dive into a major franchise so we have a lot on our plate nick so question for you james when you look at these movies that have these huge universes all of this canon do you think that that helps your enjoyment of the movie or do you think a lot of times it leads to potential pitfalls plot holes inconsistencies oh definitely both the second part's true, but I immensely enjoy expansive universes. I think watching shows and movies that have callbacks and payoffs from prior projects, I find it just to be a lot more entertaining and interesting and worth my time for investing. As much as I love one-off movies and going in for an hour and a half with a certain set of characters, I just I love having basically a whole history book of storylines and it, it can get overwhelming i think we're going through mcu fatigue right now i think that there was that whole thing at disney i don't know if it was related to laying off jobs or just they didn't want to pump out too much marvel stuff but they did cut back a lot of shows for next year i think they had to because I, I think kind of what i was referring to when you run into is when you have that much content and you're just pumping it out hand over fist a, you end up running into a lot of, and I know that they're planned out really well and they do a really good job with it. But like you said, it's hard for people to keep up with it. And then you end up, and this is so true with Star Wars too, is you end up with people who are so invested in it and then it almost isolates other fans from wanting to even get into it because they're like, I haven't, I have to catch up on 15 different series if I want to know what's going on here. The bigger you get, the more reach you're getting, but I think a lot more opinions and divisive subjects come up and it's, it's a slippery slope, but I'm, I'm here for the content. I'm here for the content guys. This week we are reviewing star Wars, the clone wars, which is the animated feature film that kicked off the TV series. This came out in 2008. It did have a theatrical run. It had a budget of $8.5 million. And actually grossed $68.3 million, so pretty dang good. Hey, you can't beat that. That's a free $60 million bucks. We'll take that to the bank. This was directed by Dave Filoni, one of my heroes, because I think he is an elevated George Lucas. George Lucas kind of introduced the universe, but Dave Filoni is a fan of the universe. So when the fan becomes the creator... I think good things happen there. Someone who's dedicated to the craft and the story and the universe, good things are going to come from that. You need people who care. Am I incorrect in saying, maybe you're not familiar with this story, I believe it was Dave Filoni who was sitting on set for a Star Wars shoot of some sort, and George Lucas was there, and I think George Lucas had 
made a decision to to add in a line for one of the characters and Dave Filoni actually corrected him and said, no, actually back in Attack of the Clones movie, Anakin said this, so this line wouldn't make sense. And and you have to have guys like that. If you want to keep a if you want to keep a story consistent, you need to have fans in the room. Uh, that sounds like something that would be totally true. And it makes sense because he he was selected in 2005 by George Lucas to help build Lucasfilm's animation studio from the ground up. And he created the company's first series, Star Wars The Clone Wars, which was the animated series that followed this movie that we're about to review. Clone Wars, Emmy award winning. I didn't know that. Yeah. Pretty good. All right. We got a good start here. So this movie stars Matt Lanter. Ashley Eckstein, James Arnold Taylor, Nika Futterman, D. Bradley Baker, and Tom Kane. If you don't recognize those names, it's because they are, for the majority, voice actors. And that's where their bread and butter is. And Is there a better job in Hollywood, James? No, we were just talking about that. Show up to work in some sweatpants and, and say your lines. No early call times. No getting mobbed at the restaurant. It's pretty sweet. So what do you what do you say, James? Why don't I read this log line and then we'll go ahead and kick this bad boy off? I'm excited. I'm excited. We are, uh, let me just uh, put a disclaimer here. We understand this is a huge undertaking. There are very much dedicated fans. A lot of really great YouTube channels and podcasts that are dedicated to nerdy content and Star Wars specifically. With that said, Nick and myself are Star Wars fans. Yeah. Definitely. I've I've really gotten into it and we're going to try and make you guys proud. We're going to try and break it down. We'll try to make it easy if you've never seen any of the Clone Wars series or movies or don't really know a lot about the animated side. We'll try to break it down and and make it a little bit more fluid because this is kind of getting thrown in to the middle of all the content. Yeah. It takes place during the prequels. It kind of bridges the gap between the prequel trilogy movies to the sequels as far as when it was released in the real world. So we will try to bring up references and, and context of this movie, which kicked off a, a whole expanded universe. Yeah, and let me pile on to that a little bit. There, there's also part of it where yeah, we are big fans. We're also looking at this as just a film. So we're going to do our best not to let any sort of fandom affect that. Like, I understand people are, are fanatics with this and, have very strong feelings. That's great. I, I do my best to try and look at everything through a, a, as objective a lens as possible. So we may have to criticize something that we like, but that's that's what we do here on Just Play It. Yeah, it'll be very difficult for me, but I will try my best. <laughs> oh, I'll do it. Okay. I don't have a soul. So here's the log line for 2008's Star Wars The Clone Wars. After the Republic's victory on Christophsis, Anakin and his new apprentice Ahsoka Tano must rescue it. the kidnapped son of Jabba the Hutt. Political intrigue complicates their mission. Okay. Ooh, all right. So let me just say this already. I'm going off track. The Clone Wars series does this a lot. This movie kicked off the series, but the Clone Wars episodes jump around a lot. Yeah. None of the episodes take place before Attack of the Clones, but there are two episodes that technically take place before this movie. Uh, One of them is from season two. It's episode 16. Sum it up real quick. It kind of opens up the Separatists having a blockade on the resource rich planet of Christophsis. Uh, Bail Organa, who is Jimmy Smith's. Mm -hmm. He's he's in the prequels. He's heavily featured in the series. So he gets trapped behind the blockade. Planet's overrun by a droid army. Obi-Wan's on his way. There's this uh, evil... Admiral Trench, who's like a giant spider person, they get really expansive with their characters and and cast in, in this series. And Anakin's there to try and help with the relief efforts that Bail Organa's doing. Obi wants Anakin to withdraw as the Jedi cruisers are getting smacked by this onslaught. This essentially is just kind of shows you how capable Anakin is in this episode, and a little bit defiant and an untraditional Jedi that he is. Whereas Obi Wan was very compliant with Qui-Gon, his old master, and he was always showing respect. And in this episode, one of my favorite moments in the whole Clone Wars series, Obi-Wan's basically like, Might I remind you that this was not your mission? You might. Anakin says, you might, and hangs up on him and then just goes goes in rogue and does his plan. And that episode kind of sets up the dynamic better because we do just kind of jump in to 
this movie and the action. And then the other episode is season one, episode 16, The Hidden Enemy. There's a traitor amongst the clone troopers. We really get to know the clone troopers in this series and in this movie. It just brings up a, an interesting dynamic of the clone troopers. This guy was working with Asajj Ventress, who is a featured antagonist in this movie. Mm hmm. In that episode, he essentially wants freedom for him and his brothers, but he's doing it the wrong way because he's working for the separatists and basically selling out his freedom and a little cash on the side for blood. And the way that this kind of connects to the movie is at the end, Ventress, she moves in towards like a squid looking ship. And that's the that's the squid ship that we see in the very beginning montage of this movie. Mm -hmm. They're on Christophsis on this episode and they say, we got to move on to my boss's next part of the plan which will be the major plot point in this movie it's fun to know that this series will go back and fill in information whether they feel it's necessary or give a little bit more context but if you're jumping into the clone Wars series it does jump around a lot so be prepared to maybe be a little lost sometimes it's okay it happens so nick where do we open up on this movie oh you ready to start some plot talk oh yeah let's get in, let's get into plot talk plot talk so this movie opens up, and we are uh, in the first year of the Clone Wars, and uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan, uh, they're leading a small battalion of the Republic clone troopers, and uh, they're also being led by Captain Rex, who's uh, kind of the main... Captain Rex is like the main featured clone that yes. we will follow throughout the entirety of this series, and, and beyond. Yeah, the, the order of rank basically goes Obi-Wan, Anakin, and then Captain Rex. He's kind of the guy right there. Captain Rex is kind of like Anakin's right hand man, and then Commander Cody is more Obi Wan's. Correct. Re Rex and Anakin get along really well. And Rex is has blue paint on his clone trooper armor, and Commander Cody has orange because it, the, again, these are clones, and it's very hard to tell them apart if they don't have tattoos or different clothes or uniforms. That's why they're clones. Uh, and and they're fighting against Count Dooku's separatist droid army uh, over there on Christophsis. So this is basically what James was setting up earlier. Uh, we're on Christophsis. There is this droid uh, insurrection. We just jump into this. We have no idea what's going on. So I think they, they wanted to tell a lot of story in this movie and just kind of rattle it off. So then later they're like, okay, we can kind of set it up in the TV series. Yes. Because it's really just like a ambiguous war between the Separatist droid army and then the Jedi and the Republic. The fight actually is going well. And so they're going to go ahead and they're waiting for reinforcements. They're trying to get through to the Jedi Temple. They're trying to talk to Yoda. They're trying to get these reinforcements, but there's some static. There's some signal blocking. But there is a shuttle that lands here on Christophsis, and we are introduced to a young Jedi Padawan uh, named Ahsoka Tano. A youngling? And who are you supposed to be? I'm Ahsoka. Now, if you've watched the Mandalorian series, if you've watched the Clone Wars or even Rebels, uh, you're very familiar with Ahsoka Tano. Orange has the ponytail tentacles going down. In, in this movie, I don't know quite how old she is, but let's peg her around 16, 17. I think she's like 12 or 13. This is the very first time we see Ahsoka Tano on screen as a character introduced in the Star Wars universe. And so if you like her as a character, you got this movie to thank. You got Dave Filoni. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I'll just bring it up now. Fans were not a fan. You're bringing up a brand new character in a completely different format that the Star Wars fans haven't seen animated. She's up against these characters we know so well, like Obi-Wan and Anakin and Yoda and Mace Windu, Padme. It was a tough little introduction. And she's very defiant and very disrespectful sometimes to her elders, which is not what we're used to seeing the Padawans be. So Correct. very abrasive to start it off. And I'm sure I'll, I'll get into a rant on this later, but this is sometimes my issue, my big issue with Star Wars fans. I am a Star Wars fan. I'm not as invested, I'll say, as some people. There's just this tendency among Star Wars fans to have this unrealistic expectation in their head about the way things should be instead of just accepting the vision of guys like Filoni who are fans and saying, okay, and the first thing they'll do, and we'll look at the reviews because you're right, James, fans were not into it. Not too kind to this movie. Yeah. Uh, and and I and I get it. I get it. I don't, but we'll get into it later. Ahsoka Tano's there. Uh, leading up to this, uh, Obi-Wan was talking about how he's going to get a new Padawan. And it's part of a Jedi's responsibility to help train the next generation. 
Padawan would just slow me down. Ahsoka, this young Padawan, gets off the ship. And Obi-Wan says, hey, welcome, you're my new apprentice. And Ahsoka informs them that Master Yoda was very strict and clear that Anakin Skywalker is to be my teacher. What? No, 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 no. There must be some mistake. He's the one who wanted the Padawan. No, Master Yoda was very specific. I'm assigned to Anakin Skywalker, and he is to supervise my Jedi training. I am a rogue agent, and that's how I want to be. Yep. Obi-Wan finally got off my back, and I can do what I want, and now you're going to tether me down with a Padawan and that responsibility? Yeah, right. Not a chance. But through going on a mission to go and deactivate the Separatist energy field, basically a, a plan to shut down the energy field, they work together, and Anakin sees the qualities that he has, this defiance, this arrogance, this kind of ego, I know what's best, don't call me a kid, I'm strong enough to fight. And he recognizes those qualities in her and, and he starts to soften up and we can tell, okay. But he does kind of get a taste of his own medicine. Like, oh, this is what Obi-Wan went through. Oh, big time. So now I get it. Sorry. Yoda knew what he was doing. Oh, yeah. Yoda, speaking of, he arrives and he informs that the gangster, Jabba the Hutt's son, Rota, I mean, they call him Stinky in the movie, so I'm going to call him Stinky. He's been kidnapped. So obviously we're, we're thinking the kidnapping has been done by the Separatists because they are the main antagonists. And Count Dooku, who was introduced in the Attack of the Clones movie, he's pretty much the overarching main villain in the series. So they're featuring him heavily in this movie. And, you know, Darth Sidious, Palpatine, he's more than likely behind it because behind Dooku, there is Darth Sidious. He's the Sith Lord. He controls all the all the dark side shenanigans. So they're kidnapping Stinky. We don't know why yet, but they are doing it. And this is a question, Nick. This is a little bit more, I guess, political. So the the Jedi's are a little hypocritical here because they say, "Well, we're keepers of the peace." They say this in the movies a lot, but then they end up siding with the Republic because it's a little bit more coinciding with what they believe in, obviously, versus the separatists who just kind of take over planets, set up blockades, restrict resources. Mm -hmm. So they are like, oh, we're peaceful. But then they're like, but if we got to get down, we'll start fighting and we're going to be on the Republic side. It's kind of fascinating. So that's one side of it. Um, and the other side is they want to kind of work with this criminal warlord uh, or at least get his blessing. So it's kind of it kind of makes me think of like we don't we don't negotiate with terrorists, but they're totally willing to kind of play sides and like give aid to the criminal if they're in need. Like his son's been kidnapped, so he's like, "You better help me out." And they're like, "Well, if we help him out, he's a gangster, but at the same time, we can have safe passage through his trade routes." So how do you feel about government? getting uh, their hands dirty working with like the mob or well, something fr from just a political standpoint it's been common throughout history it's very common uh, as far as it well, refers the jedi to, are so like highbrow with their morals well so so interesting because right that's that's really anakin's descent into darth vader is not getting the jedi to basically hold the moral ground that they say they're going to hold and instead playing the politics and he thinks it leads to a lot of bad outcomes when they're being a little more on the wishy-washy side. You know, we can't do this because there's politics at play. And Anakin's whole thing is, no, but if it's the correct thing to do, we need to do it, even if we're disobeying. Again, that's the whole descent of, of Anakin's character. There's a uh, yeah crazy story arc in season five that involves Ahsoka and Anakin and betrayal with the whole Jedi Order mistrust and questioning of morals and codes and questioning the order. So yeah. And that's definitely plays a big part as to why Anakin has such distrust in the Jedi council. The Jedi council kind of shunned him when he first came into the fold as well. They didn't trust him. So there's been this massive distrust. There's been friction ever since. Really Qui-Gon Jinn was the one who was the first one to really break the rules. Qui-Gon really fucked it all up. <laughs> <laughs> really, at the end of the day. But just the last thing I'll say there is if I had to compare it to anything, it, I would compare it to maybe like the, the Jedi Order is very similar to, say, like a religion or a church. You know, when a church gets a little too big and starts siding with 
forces that aren't part of their church and starts siding with politics, getting more concerned about money, maybe some power, maybe, and all of a sudden you're no longer the church, right? You're 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 so far gone from your original mission. We have morals, and this is yeah, this is our mission, but we are going to also side with whole political party or a company or whatever. And then you kind of get lost in the sauce. So it is interesting because we do love Yoda. We do love Mace Windu. We do love Obi-Wan Kenobi, but they are all part of this council. That's a little hypocritical. Yes. And they, they join the Republic and they join the army with that said, I do love these costumes. I think it's the sickest, the Jedi look oh, because yeah. they, they're kind of half robe, but half armor. They got the yeah. They got the chest plates. They got the gauntlets. It's a good look. It's it's one of my favorite Jedi looks because there's the real droopy robes. I was reading up on this. It may have been because the animation wasn't quite there to animate flowy robes. So that's why they're like, oh, we're gonna like give them a little bit more hardened clothing, like armor. It'll just make for easier animation. After I read that, I was looking at a couple Jawas. Their face hood is a little static. And I was like, I can kind of see that it's not it's, the animation wasn't where it is today. So I, I'm not sure if the animation, it, I, I would say it wasn't quite there because I think there's some good animation from the time. I think correctly, and this is how I feel about the animation style in this movie and the series is the story is so much more important than the animation that you could cut some corners on animation if it means you can pump out episodes faster and you can create these series and these storylines and substance oh, yeah. inside of it. So exactly. Uh, you know what? Yeah. Whether it's the art style wasn't there or the animation was, I've never been a big critic of art style. If you can put your story across, I, I have eyes. I can put it together. Like I'm not here to I look have no at. qualms with the art style at all. I'm just, I'm, I'm bringing that up because I, think, I know some people do. Oh, okay. Well, screw them. That's, that's just why. I'm, yeah. I think the Jedi looks sick in the Clone War era. Might be my favorite. I'll agree with that. Big time. Right, let's keep this uh, train rolling here. Let's do it. So Anakin and his new Padawan, Ahsoka, are now tasked with traveling to go and retrieve uh, the Hutlet, is what they refer to it as, the, the, the job of the Hut's son. Again, as after talks between the Republic and the Jedi and saying, oh, should we be dealing with Jabba the Hut? And then ultimately, they do. To that point, Obi-Wan is the one sent to Tatooine to negotiate with Jabba over the treaty with the Huts. So they're sending basically their like most prized Jedi as an ambassador. It was funny because they're like, we're so busy. The only ones that we can send are Obi-Wan and Anakin. It's like, okay, so you can send like your two best ones. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't think there's better Jedi. It, like, there's some really good Jedi out there. Mason Yoda, maybe. But like, it was like your two warriors constantly work together. In the middle of a war. Oh, no. What a couple of scrubs. Uh, so surprise, surprise, Anakin and Ahsoka, they do track down the kidnapper. So they track him to the planet Teth. They're ambushed by the Separatist forces. Make some pretty quick work of them. It's just some droids who is led by the former Jedi, Asajj Ventress, as you were mentioning earlier. She's the right hand to Count Dooku. It's interesting because Asajj Ventress is saying, the Jedi are here. Do you want me to strike? Do you want me to take them down? I can easily do it. And Count Dooku's like, patience, let my plan play out. The next scene or two, when they're making their way through this facility, Ahsoka and Anakin, Ahsoka's like, aren't we walking into a trap master? Like, don't you want me to take care of these droids? And Anakin's like, I know, I know what's happening. So there's a little bit of parallels going on with the, the master planner and the apprentice. In between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, we don't really ever get to see Anakin grow too much, much of his personality. And what this movie and this show does a lot is it really gives Anakin a lot more depth than what Hayden Christensen was able to give him in episodes two and three. Yeah, and I don't 100% blame Hayden. I think if you're in a part of a studio in a writer's room and a director and an editor, I think someone's got to kind of direct him better or write it better. But I will get, I'll put a little bit of blame on on Hayden Christensen, but since, you know, now it's kind of a little bit of a uh, flipped feelings from fans, you know, they, they're welcoming him back in the live action shows. I won't put it all on, on uh, Hayden Christensen, but well, Hayden Christensen in episode three was much better than episode two. And, and I think a lot of that had to do with the writing and the story itself, but yeah, you got to also direct the guy better. That's saying it very lightly, Nick, 
of showing uh, a little bit more depth for Anakin in the series. It this uh, this series and this movie kicking it off does so much heavy lifting of making Anakin Skywalker such a better character because the movies pretty much just paint the picture of him being a whiny asshole and the show you're like, Oh, he was funny and he was charming and he had good plans and he was the unconventional Jedi. And every time he went against the code and the protocols, it was fun and it worked out. Whereas in the movies, when he would question things or want to do something, Obi-Wan would just kind of shut it down and then he would just get pissed off. Right. So we only got all the negative sides of Anakin Skywalker in the movies. And then we got so much more positives with still some, some downs for Anakin in the series. It flips the whole prequels on its head. Oh, that's the biggest problem for me with the prequels is Anakin's downfall is supposed to be a tragedy. You're supposed to love him as a character and his eventual breaking into the dark side is supposed to be a very heavy and heartbreaking moment. But as an audience, we never fell in love with Anakin as a character. And so when he when he ended up fighting Obi-Wan at the end of episode three, we're like, yeah, this is in his character because he's just kind of been a whiny pent up bitch this whole time who has clearly wanted to fight Obi-Wan the entire time. It doesn't build their friendship. Watching the whole show and getting up to that final season does make it a lot more heartbreaking. So I do find that to be such an interesting phenomenon. But when you're back in the early 2000s watching these, you're just like, I I understand this sucks, but I'm not that emotionally invested because I don't necessarily like Anakin because he is just such a villainous character even if he's quote unquote a good guy in the movies i couldn't agree more if you haven't watched clone wars and you watch clone wars and you enjoy it or say you've only watched the clone Wars series and you haven't watched uh star wars rebels that's basically what takes place after revenge of the sith it's fantastic it's about five five years before the events of a new hope yeah it, that that is a plus as well but uh anakin and ahsoka end up escaping off of teth in, a, in an old beat up transport uh, along with r2d2 and uh they're using that they're going to travel back to tatooine at this time anakin's able to warn obi-wan about what's going on and so obi-wan arrives at teth and now he's going to fight ventress in a lightsaber duel master kenobi always chasing after skywalker anakin leaves quite a mess which always leads me to you ventress uh, which is good. I like the lightsaber duels in this movie. There's so much more you can do with the animation. I think that it's not a, a bold statement to say animation allows you to go above and beyond with visuals. And so I really enjoy the fight scenes in this film. They're fun. There's a lot of flips. There's a lot of flying. There's a lot of flashing lasers. They're, they do a lot of high jumping and flips in the in the animated series than they do in the live action ones, which they should do more of. It probably back then cost you like, 50 grand a flip in the live action because <laughs> you have to yeah they get them rigged up on the wires or it cost a bunch of cgi money but in the animation they just flip flop flippity flop they're just flying through the, the top, air which is a lot more fun i need to point something out during this fight so during this fight obi-wan says we know your plan of so so the plan essentially was oh we're not only going to kidnap stinky the little hutlet we're going to kidnap him and then have the Jedi rescue him and and then tell Jabba the Hutt that the Jedi kidnapped the Hutlet and try and turn it on them. They're trying to frame the Jedi Order of the Republic so that Jabba the Hutt will flip on them and say, oh, I'm with the Separatist side now. So you guys, if you finish this mis- mission, I'll grant you safe passage through my drug routes or whatever I do. The, the trade routes, yeah. Because I'm a criminal slug lord. That's the whole master plan. At first, you're thinking, oh, these kid, they're kidnapping the hut because they're evil, but there's a bigger plan at play here. Obi-Wan says, we know your plan to kidnap the hutlet and frame it on us. And I was like, hold up. I was like, I rewound it. I was like, when did they figure that out? There's a transmission when Obi-Wan just kind of randomly calls in to Anakin and Ahsoka. You know, this is after they retrieve Stinky, and he says, I think the Separatists are behind this. And then literally, like, right after that, Obi-Wan's like, I bet Dooku is using us to make Jabba join the Separatist. So he just immediately called it. 
Uh, that's not unlike Obi Wan though. He's a big picture guy. He understands how everything works. He even off the bat, I think they were kind of shocked that they would kidnap Jabba the Hutt's kid. Like it was, it kind of was fishy off of the start. Like this doesn't make sense. It was high IQ, but I had to rewind. I was like, when did they? When did they figure that out? But Obi Wan's got a big brain. That's why he's one of the best Jedi around. Some may say the greatest Jedi ever. That's a story for another day. We've won. Lay down your weapon. Jedi scum. So Obi-Wan beats Ventress. Uh, not surprisingly, Obi-Wan's great. Uh, but Ventress escapes, and now they have a problem on their hands, right? Because now the Jedi know what the plan is. They're going to try and foil it. So Dooku's going to have to go ahead and try and spin this some other way because they can't let the truth get out now. Otherwise, they don't get the Hutch trade routes. And Dooku at this point has... When he's gone to Tatooine and talked to Jabba the Hutt and is spinning his lies to the, the Hutt clan. When Ahsoka and Anakin actually do make the journey to Tatooine, the Force theme plays, as we know. Like where we first heard it when Luke was looking at those two sons on Tatooine. The Force theme plays and then we hear uh, a yell of a Tusken Raider. Or if you're racist, you'd say a sand person. But after the book of Boba Fett, we humanize them. We call them Tuscan Raiders, but you hear the Tuscan Raider yell, Sand people. And you're just like, ooh, yikes. What's wrong, Annie? I killed them all. And then he's saying that to Padme in Attack of the Clones. Padme's like, I don't know if I feel safe around you now. Yeah. <laughs> Literally just murdered a tribe of Tuscan Raiders. I know that this isn't our goal here to point out issues with the prequels, but the whole Anakin Padme in the prequels their relationship was almost like stalkerish, Stockholm syndrome. It was weird. I wouldn't go that far, but it definitely wasn't. It was less romantic and a little bit more predatory. Yeah, big time. Whereas, again, you come here to the Clone Wars and there's actually caring for each other. Yeah, there's there's a lot more of that in the series and a little bit of that in the movie. Padme does show up at the end. I forgot she was in this. Well, she's about to show up right here. She's brought into Palpatine's office and basically like, let me go talk to Jabba the Hutt's uncle who lives here on Coruscant. Uh, and I forgot this fool was in this Zero oh. the Hut, who, to paint the picture, is a purple hut with kind of gold markings. And he sounds like a southern cartman. A senator in this neighborhood. <laughs> and he also speaks English or whatever the hell the regular language is in the Star Wars universe. So the Huts, it's weird. The Huts are the Huts, they're the Hut clan, the Hut family mob, but they also have their own language called Hut knees. Be like if the mob had mob knees, mobonomics. I think it'd be similar to say the mob in a in a world where there, everything was global and the entire mob was Italian. They spoke Italian, and you'd just be like, yeah, the mob speaks Italian. Okay, so so Jabba the Hutt just means like Jabba the Italian, and he's just like, "Hey, I'm J- I'm Jabba the Hutt. I'm Italian." Except he's like, <laughs> "It's very yeah, it'd be like, blah, like blah, 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 blah. They do use their hands a lot when they're talking. So could, do, could, do they have hands? Oh yeah, I guess they have little slimy fins, little like do, claw do things. Does Jabba the uh, Hutt have, Jabba the Hutt have fingers? Yeah, they're like three fingers, like little talons. I'm googling Jabba the Hutt hands. Oh, yeah, no, he does have little fingers. If you recall in uh, Return of the Jedi, when he has Princess Leia by that collar with the chain, he he does have hold of the chain with those little grubby fucking hands. (laughs) Those grubby fucking hands. Yeah, they're weird little things, huh? You just looked it up. Yeah, you're going to see that in your nightmares tonight. Well, a bigger slime ball than Jabba's hands is his Uncle Zero, who is just a... I would say a little stinker, but he's a big, fat, slippery stinker. Yes. This slug. Padme then finds out that Zero the Hut was actually the one who conspired with Dooku to have the Hutlet, to have Stinky, not just kidnapped, but murdered. They were going to go through with the whole murder thing uh, so that Jabba would execute Anakin and Ahsoka. Just kind of get them out of the way. Yeah, leading to... And then if he killed Anakin and Ahsoka the Jedi Council would then arrest Jabba the Hutt, and then Zero could take over the power of the Hutt clan. So there was this whole little extra mob dynamic 
going on. What if she found out I helped you kidnap Jabba's son? Yeah, Padme comes in, tries to talk to Zero. She leaves and then eavesdrops and hears this information. And then she ends up getting caught and captured. Classic Padme. Classic Padme. But she's not a damsel in distress. She she gets her hands dirty. She goes to the underground seedy places to get this information. She's really good with a blaster. She is. She's a she's goddamn badass. As far as princesses go, she's pretty self-sufficient. Well, she's not princess anymore. She's a senator. And that's she's what, a senator. That's why she dropped that shit. She's like, I'm not royalty. I want to be I want be for the people. And if I got to do some dirty shoot them up stuff for my government, I will because I'm shady like the entire Republic and the Jedi Order. I don't want royalty shooting people up. I want my elected officials doing that, please. Thank you. So uh, C-3PO actually shows up and with a bunch of clone troopers who save the day. Speaking of clone troopers, I got to just shout out D. Bradley Baker. He voices all the clones because they have the same voice. Captain Rex, he's Commander Cody. He's had a lot of success with this whole show and it's been his. He kind of gets his own time to shine with the new animated series called The Bad Batch, which takes place directly after Order 66. And he voices all five of those guys with different voices because they're a little bit genetically altered clones. And that's their whole shtick. So I am thoroughly enjoying The Bad Batch. Roger, Roger. Love D. Bradley Baker. I'm glad he's getting work. He's earned it. And he he's a guy who's just made his career off of voice acting. I mean, I, I looked him up on IMDb. And in the year t- 2022 alone, this man has done probably 30 different projects, 40 different projects. Little things, video games, Space Jam, voiceovers, Space Jam. He was Daffy Duck. Uh, he did all the Lego Star Wars. Anything you can imagine, this man's done a voice in. And good for him because voice actors stay employed. Good on D. Bradley Baker. We love you, man. New friend of the show. Please come on anytime you want, D. So the clones come in, they save Padme, they recover um, her. And meanwhile, back on Tatooine, there's a whole skirmish between Count Dooku and Anakin because they picked up life forms out in the desert. He goes out, they have another Jedi lightsaber battle. It turns out Stinky's not with Anakin, he's with Ahsoka. And he, again, has put trust in this Padawan, something that he never got as a Padawan. It seemed like in the live action movies, Obi-Wan never really gave him his chance or gave him jobs to do on his own or trusted his rogue idea. So we are starting to see progression between Ahsoka and Anakin. It's very much like somebody who says, oh, my dad was this way. I'll never be that way. I'll be a better dad than that. Exactly. And so he kind of has that mindset when it comes to Ahsoka. You can start to see that he even uh, earlier in the movie. Uh, when she was talking about their first battle that she saved his life and she's telling everybody the story. She was telling it to all the other clone troopers. Anakin just lets her tell the story and be the hero. And they go, it, they go, is that true? And he goes, yeah, sure. Is that true, sir? <laughs> well, most of it. You know, de- definitely lets her have her day in the sun. So, And their relationship, that's why this show is so great. And I don't want to have the show blind my movie review but i have to bring it up and it it is showcased in this movie a little bit their relationship is a lot more informal that's pretty obvious you know he doesn't play by the rules and neither does she and somehow that meshes well which is great at one point anakin actually says they need to follow orders and and stay behind until reinforcements show up but this is when stinky is is sick and they need to get him off planet ahsoka debate she says no we need to go get Jabba's kid to Tatooine right now. Like we need to do that. That's what's right. And Anakin says, okay, I'll trust you on this one. Like you said, kind of like that. I'll never be like my, my dad. I'll never be like my old master. And you know, in the live action movies, Obi-Wan, it always kind of seemed like he was trying to like say like, Oh, I'm right. I'm the older one. Uh, You got to listen to me. You got to respect me. And Anakin would lash out sometimes. And then us as the audience would be like, whoa, why'd you say that to Obi-Wan? Like, you can't disrespect him like that. And I don't know if it's because it's an animated movie and it's a little bit easier to get a little cute with it and it doesn't seem as brash, but Ahsoka's defiant and Anakin puts trust in her. Obi-Wan was always trying to overrule Anakin's idea um, to the side. And that's where he just kind of grew frustrated and grew that resentment that we saw in the live action movies. 
Yeah, it was a lot of resentment around Obi-Wan always telling him, you'll understand later. I don't have time to explain this to you now. You'll get it one day. And that's frustrating to hear. I kind of got, yeah, I, I got it. I got Anakin's frustration in the movies. Yeah, I just wish it was portrayed better. There's another point when Anakin is, uh, Ahsoka's addressing her doubt of being too young to be his Padawan, and he throws out a Qui-Gon Jinn quote. What are you trying to prove, anyway? That I'm not too young to be your Padawan. Ahsoka, a very wise Jedi once said nothing happens by accident. It is the will of the Force that you're at my side. He's like, oh, a very wise Jedi said nothing happens by accident, and this is what Qui-Gon Jinn says to Anakin and the Phantom Menace uh, when he meets him. And he's like, oh, I don't think our paths crossing is an accident. Anakin is already being a little bit more supportive of Ahsoka and her doubt. And correct me if I'm wrong, but is doubt something that leads to the dark side? I, is there something in the back of my mind? I can hear Yoda. Yes. Doubt, doubt leads to fear. Doubt leads to fear. Doubt leads, fear to, leads fear. to hate. Fear leads to hate. Hate leads to the dark side. Anakin's trying to shut it down. He, you know, he listens to his Padawan. He's much more Qui- Qui-Gon than he is Obi-Wan. You know, Anakin wants to stay back and help his troops because uh, they are not expendable in his eyes. So kind of going back to that episode that technically took place in the timeline when there's that mm-hmm. clone trader and he's like, we're just your slaves. We do your dirty work and you guys don't care. He wants to stay behind and help his troops. But Ahsoka says, no, we need to go. And Anakin listens to his Padawan. It's just polar opposites of Obi-Wan and Anakin's apprenticeship. And it's what makes Ahsoka a different Jedi. She's a little bit more informal like Anakin. Huh. So it's okay when you don't follow what the council says. Doing what the Jedi council says, that's one thing. How we go about doing it, that's another. That's what I'm trying to teach you, my young Padawan. In my opinion, she is basically what Anakin could have been if he had never gone down the dark side path. They're both a little bit informal. They're both kind of OP with the, the lightsaber. She's super OP with the lightsaber and for how young she is. She's ready to be out in the field. She never really got field training. This is kind of her first mission to go out there. And while Anakin is for- facing Dooku, she's wrecking these Magna Guards. Toe to toe. Not even a question mark. She just absolutely puts them down. Toe to toe. Yeah, she can hold her own and, and Anakin put trust in her. And, you know, it, it's refreshing to see that because it did get a little bit not mundane, but just like, OK, yeah, we get it. The Jedi are so regal and honorable, but the same time we kind of like the bad boys you know we like the bad girls we like i don't play by the rules and then you know if we see them fumble we'll see them make it out of a situation but we like a rebel you know we're human we're human we're not we're not all saints so it is it's refreshing to see yeah it's it's the dichotomy of doing the right thing versus the correct thing and and so do we follow protocol do we go and do what we know is right it that's a star wars question that is throughout the entire universe honestly the entire property of star wars is filled with that push and pull yeah always a captivating subject in movies of doing what's right and doing what's what you feel is right yeah anakin and ahsoka eventually deliver stinky to jabba after defeating uh separatists and jabba wants them executed anyway because he still believes it was a kidnapping attempt by the jedi but padme ends up contacting jabba right in the nick of time and uh, reveals that Zero and the Separatists were responsible for the kidnapping. And Job was just like, oh, OK. Uh, and then he's going to deal with Zero later. We're assuming he's going to go ahead and uh, give him the old Sopranos treatment. Spoiler alert, they don't because he fucking shows up in the series again. And it's like, this guy, this guy again. I mean, would it even just would it even choke him out? Would it just kind of slip through him and he would just kind of like like jello just kind of like the the choke wire just you could s- choke out a hut that's how jabba died that's true in Return i'm, think- of the Jedi, I'm thinking so. of a mafia tight wire whereas jabba got choked out by the chains of princess leia's i don't think they're like permeable jello people well i'm just saying maybe that's what happened if they did try to give him the old mafia hug i would i would say it'd be really hard to find the actual neck uh they're pretty much all neck it's an it's a big neck with a tail and arms and a face. It's an interesting character. Sidebar. It's really interesting that Jabba was not quite a I wouldn't say side character in the original trilogy, but he wasn't 
that I mean, he was an antagonist for certain scenes and, and small storylines with Han Solo. But the fact that he was so iconic that now we have this expanded Star Wars universe where the Hut are pretty prominently featured now. And we and and this this movie introduces like oh there wasn't just Jabba the Hut there is the Hut clan and yeah uh, you know maybe they maybe they mention that in the movies but this is the first time we see a, a different Hut and there's and we see that in Book of Boba Fett there's like those weird conjoined twins or or if they were separated I never found that out like a cat dog situation they looked conjoined but I I think they were separated but yeah so there's this whole race of Hut and we never know how they gain power because they physically intimidating they are not because you just walk away from them and then shoot them so i don't don't know how they amass their power Uh, yeah i don't know just a big crime lord so padme uh chimes in just in the nick of time when jabba's ready to off anakin and ahsoka she introduces the truth and then brings in zero and then he is he confesses to his crimes to Jabba the Hutt. I had no choice. Dooku said he'd kill me if I didn't help him kidnap Jabba's son. You have to believe me. I love that Hutlet. Zero. Taja Wuchiska. Mabango Jabba. And Jabba's like, all right, you, never, never mind. You guys are good. And we'll, we'll sign the treaty with the Republic. So they're signing along with criminals. That's nothing. No problem. Enemy of my enemy, I guess. Uh, so, yeah. And then the movie ends with Dooku reporting the plot's failure to Darth Sidious. It was Count Dooku! Uh, and Darth Sidious basically says, don't worry about it. We're still, we're basically, we're, we're still in charge here. He's like, I'm still pulling the strings. But we do get a little, uh, kind of like at the end of A New Hope, everyone's like lined up and got their award. A little bit of similar feeling here. Everyone's just lined up, kind of facing the camera, just like, we did it. Yeah, it's a very Star Warsy scene. And the Clone Wars music swells. It does a little closing picture and says directed by Dave Filoni. Boom. That wraps up plot talk. I just want to uh, kind of get into our our nitpicks here, if you don't mind. Okay. Nitpicks. I won't say this is a necessarily a nitpick because it does kind of overarch this entire movie, but this movie's plot is simple and it does feel like just a giant episode of a Clone Wars story arc. Yes. It's pretty uh, random where the movies were like, oh, we're grooming this kid from the desert to become this the best Jedi ever. And then, oh, he's going to fight the bad guy. Oh, and his bad guy's a father. This is crazy. And then this movie's like, yeah, we're opening up on a war scene and Jabba the Hutt's kid's been stolen. Now it's up to us to go save him. Let's go do it. Adventure time. It's not really, there's not a a whole lot at stake. It's really just like the main goal is to get safe passage through the outer rim, through Jabba the Hutt's routes that he controls. He has his hand in. That's pretty much it. It's pretty. It's a small story in the Clone Wars series. And I agree. It could have just been four episodes of the Clone Wars. So that's why we kind of just fast forwarded through the plot because it is pretty simple. And I think we have it, the universe is expansive. We don't want to get too bogged down with all the details in this movie because yeah. there's a ton of references to the movies. Honestly, some that probably went over our head because I'm not that that deep to catch every single e- Easter egg for Star Wars. One thing I did catch was when uh, Obi-Wan was fighting Asajj Ventress. He did the Obi-Wan pose that we all know and love where kind of yes. the, the arm over the head and the lightsaber. That's like his defensive pose. We see that in revenge of the sith we see that actually in rebels too uh so he does he does his obi-wan pose another thing with that fight is that i think this might be the first time can i, can I stop you right there? oh please it's very interesting actually because i actually have gone deep into this before it's a lightsaber combat technique that qui-gon jing taught him uh Ceresu. and actually a Ceresu huge three part- i believe it's form three which it's is form Ceresu. three i did my form research three. too nick yeah <laughs> no, I, I trust me. I've gone down some YouTube rabbit holes on this, and actually, a huge hell yeah, a, a huge uh, may the people. may the fourth be with you, you filthy nerds. I give Star Wars a lot of shit personally, but I I am a huge fan because I am such a fan. I am more critical of it because you care, just like Filoni. Because I care, I busted out my John Favreau Paz Vizsla action figure for this pod. So this guy right here, thank you, John. For bringing in the Mandalorian. Thank you, Dave, for literally changing my life. I will shout out my old co-worker, Diego, because he did tell me to watch Clone Wars. Diego, you changed my life. 
not in like any important significant way, but you did change it because I am a lot more invested in Star Wars now. Thanks, Diego. I, I think what's really interesting because when you get to Rebels, it's a Star Wars Rebels. So right, we have Clone Wars and then we have Revenge of the Sith and then Rebels. Everything has started to kind of fall into place. Like all the timelines are starting to become accounted for in the Star Wars canon, which I think is what they always needed, which is something I think they did really well with the Rogue One. Mm hmm. Kind of having that in between storyline that says, "Hey, here, here's what happened in between, and give us some background in what's happening in the universe." Right in between these two things, here's what was happening politically, strategically. Here's what was happening within the the military forces, and it doesn't take much. It's a side story that you don't need all the main canon characters for, but it just adds so much into the universe. It really, really flushes it out in a really great way. And if I ever had to put a, a huge nail in the coffin of the prequels, it said it should have been five to six movies. They rushed it. They rushed through it and then they jumped over timelines like Anakin's development timeline, right? He goes from a nine-year-old kid. I don't know his exact age. Phantom Menace, he's a kid. And then we see him as a teenager. And then we see him in his third. There's so much development. Why did you do three movies? Make it six. We missed out on all of Anakin's development and just saw these tiny little showcases of how much of a little douche he was or just not not a likable guy at all. And Star Wars does that a lot. They, I don't want to give George Lucas a bunch of crap, but he did just kind of... He literally started a series in the fourth movie. He's just like, yeah, so what's happening. Princess Leia has some plans. We don't know what it's for, but she got them. We don't know how. And... Like you said, with Rogue One, that whole movie is about the Death Star and its construction and the plan and retrieving the plan and how many lives were lost getting those plans to Princess Leia. And it has the sickest Darth Vader entrance ever in any of the Star Wars properties and projects. But it just it adds so much more depth and importance. And that's what the Clone Wars does and Rebels. The And I think they're doing this with the Mandalorian and the Bad Batch, I think now that is now the Band-Aid for the sequel series. They are starting to build up, fill gaps, fill holes, because... We could just throw the sequels away, in my opinion. Well, I think they're trying to do what Clone Wars and Rebels did for the prequels, which is provide context and slap a giant Band-Aid over this entire trilogy. Because someone needs to explain to me the line... Oscar Isaac Hernandez Estrada says, which is somehow Palpatine returns. <laughs> and that's the line, how he's introduced uh, did, back in the movie. Well, the, again, the we're, word, going off, we're going off. The, we're going off words, just on some Star Wars stuff. The here, word but. somehow is the problem. And so now Dave Filoni and the gang are like, oh, my God, give me my coffee. I got to make five, seven series to explain this bullshit. It's it's so bad. Uh, I mean, I we, we could go. I don't want to get biggest, too side. I I may have started a tangent on you, but you know, I'll let you have the floor. The biggest issue. I, I'll try to keep it succinct, but it's what we kind of talked about at the beginning, where you need to have fans in the room, and you need to have consistency. And I believe what the 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 three sequels they they had different directors, so. Uh, it was uh, J uh, J J Abrams on seven J. J. and Abrams. nine, and then it, I think it was the guy that knives out actually for the eighth movie. It, Rian. Rian Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson. Ryan Johnson. J.J. Abrams hated the direction of number eight so much because he thought number eight should have built up the return of Palpatine. And Abrams was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just writing number nine. I'm just doing number nine anyway, the way that I was going to do it. And I don't care if it's inconsistent. And it just screwed the whole thing up. And that's and that's the thing. It's like the studio getting in the way or just, you know, they're like, oh, let's let's pump out some Star Wars movie, make some money. Even number seven. Let's make some freaking. Well, that was just a regurgitation of number four. Literally, stormtroopers, kid from Desert Planet, a droid. Meets Han Solo and. William Falcon. Anyway. Yeah, it's tough. So, if that's what they're trying to do with Mandalorian and Bad Batch, because they are kind of introducing like some like clone conspiracy stuff in there, which makes sense for the Bad Batch and will draw a lot from Mandalorian and kind of put a lot of importance on that. And. And Grogu, Grogu, his role in all this. So yes, I, unfortunately, I think that's what they're doing. Uh, even though I, I just want to enjoy those shows for what they are and just kind of expand the universe. But I do think it is in preparation for a giant band aid of what is 
the turd show of the sequels. Somehow Palpatine returned. Yikes. Nothing against the actors and the characters, just misdirection and inconsistency. Can't be having it, especially with a fan base like that. So, James, I see you have a nitpick here. Oh, yeah. We were on nitpicks, actually. Uh, I'm really enjoying this conversation, Nick. It's very fluid. Like we said, it's a little bit different. It's not a single. This is no Wraith or Fifth Element or Pluto Nash. Or or war games. This is not a singular thing we're going off of. We're this is ex- more philosophical. Of we're diving into Wars a lot universe. here. We're, yeah. we're we're taking a huge bite out of this Star Wars cookie on May the third, and hopefully you're listening on May the third or the fourth. That'd be even better on your part. But but I just want to know how certain things work. Like Force Sense. There's a moment when Ventress and Obi Wan are fighting, and Obi Wan says, "Oh, you can sense it too." Anakin is left with the child. I sense it too. Anakin is gone. You failed, Ventress. So they know that's happening. But then Obi Wan freaking walks right past Dooku outside Jabba the Hutt's palace. He didn't sense him then. There's no Spidey sense then. Like, I, it seems like it's always just kind of convenient for the plot. Well, well, Sith can hide themselves. Uh, he did have his hood up. Sith can hide themselves. There's a reason that Palpatine walked among the Jedi Order for years. It's true. Because he can, he, can, he can mask his Force abilities. Because otherwise, you should be able to sense another Force creature. Sith have that Force ability to cloak themselves. You have plucked that pick for me. The other thing is just like a general See, I, thing. I have some Star Wars knowledge, my man. Oh, man. I didn't that doubt being you. Said, I didn't doubt that you. being said, Star Wars has... And George Lucas himself have a bad habit of making up powers and just saying this yes. is just how it is. When Princess Leia flew I was in gonna, the sequels. I was going to say that. Well, did she fly or did she float? <laughs> her she arms were behind her and she was propelling forward. I think she did have a Superman pose, maybe. It was very Superman pose. It looked like Captain Marvel going through the going through the air. But to kind of piggyback on that with my general nitpick is just the phenomenon of TV series and new shows and new movies kind of introducing these new powers. And it does kind of open up a can of worms of abilities that don't remain consistent across all the movies and shows like i mean to go back to one of our favorites stealth when the ai fighter jet could pinpoint a target in the crowd but then later in the movie he couldn't he couldn't do that to literally find someone that they were trying to find it's just kind of inconsistent so like in the series for example when characters are falling off a cliff there's one episode where they use the force to push the ground below them and they can just safely land so then whenever you get to like a scene where they're on a high surface, you're like, oh, well, they should just be able to do that because they did it that one time in that one episode. Yes. So it just kind of opens up a little inconsistency. That that's ve- very much makes sense for the show because that, that should all be the same universe. I think where Star Wars ran into a lot of trouble was th- the Force abilities were really limited by what you can show on the screen. Yoda lifting the x-wing out of the dagobah swamp being able to lift an object and like what that blew the audience's mind back then and then you get to the prequels and all of a sudden the prequels you have to have cooler force effects and now you get to the obi-wan show where he can like lift all of the rocks and throw them all it's they just have to get more powerful because if it was the same visual appeal that you had back when the original series audience would be like what that was so <laughs> underwhelming. So you, you just have to keep like upping the ante on force abilities. And at a certain point, you're like, okay, well, this is no longer consistent with the force abilities that were established. They get a lot more creative with the force abilities in the shows and especially in the video games. Obviously, that's kind of translates the gameplay and different abilities you get to learn. But yeah, in the OG trilogy, it's fun to do that. A yeah. lot of it was just like push and pull, push and pull. Like I'm using the force push to push it. Mind reading. And then kind of later stuff. in the series, it's like, oh, we use the force to communicate with force ghosts. And there's like all this like convoluted, crazy, complicated. Yeah, the stuff. force can do anything. And now all of a sudden you're like, oh. Yeah. And it's so, just like at a certain point, why don't you fight with the force? Yeah. Why use the force? I always wondered that. Why don't you just like lift up the lightsaber and like you could just be standing 20 feet back and the lightsaber could be doing. When you introduce fantastical things, you introduce a fantastical amount of questions of why didn't you use the force in this situation? Yeah, it's just it's just the the trap of steady escalation over the course of 40, 50 years. 
that's my nitpick, and it ain't that big. That's fair. Uh, I didn't have any nitpicks just because I, I didn't really wasn't trying to look for too many, especially knowing that this is really part of a TV series. A lot of things are explained later on in the show. If this was a standalone movie, I'd probably have more questions, but no nitpicks from your guy over here. Hey, I see you have a couple questions here. I do have some questions for you. So the overarching question is, how does this all work together? More specifically, do we like the idea of the series and movie working in conjunction with the live action? Like, are you a fan of this device for building the Star Wars universe? I think I know the answer. 100% yes, because I did. We we touched upon it while we're walking through this movie. It flushes out the prequels so much more. And being like a casual back in the day and just kind of like, eh, I'll watch Star Wars because it's, it's very popular. You know, you have no connection to Anakin Skywalker and the way it was directed and written and performed. You're just kind of like left like, okay, all right. Well, it was a little underwhelming when the third movie wrapped up because you're like, damn, that's it. Like the, the OG movie is, is so magical and it's a mystery and it's fun and it's an adventure. And you got these lovable characters and then the prequels come in. It's a little bit schlocky CGI, not the best interpretation of Anakin Skywalker. So you're kind of just left like, dang, that's it. All right. Well, cool. I guess the six episode movie arc is wrapped up and there it is. And then you jump into this. This is three years after that. You're kind of like, OK, I, I guess I'll give this a sh- seems like it's for kids, but uh, I, it's part of the Star Wars canon. I'll give it a shot. And then when you just go through the entire series, you just have so much more appreciation for all the characters and the way they they kind of explain other characters backgrounds. And um, they'll actually take characters in the background from the movies and give them entire episode arcs, give them give them three Mm -hmm. episode story arcs uh, like um, Plo Koon, Mm -hmm. Master Fisto. And it definitely just like makes it a lot more richer and makes you a lot more invested. Uh, so do you think that other any other properties could benefit by taking a similar path? Uh, like specific? And I'm not asking you to call out any specific. Oh, okay. I- if you were creating a brand new universe, would you say this would be a good strategy to pursue? Have theatrical releases, have TV shows, have everything that if you have a plan to do to do that, it sounds like you're a studio that just wants to keep making content and keep making money and keep people employed, mm-hmm. which is great. I think the thing with Star Wars is they introduced the original trilogy. They made the prequels. And I don't know if it just wasn't because fans weren't satisfied or people like Dave Filoni weren't satisfied, but they wanted to do right by the name of Star Wars and kind of flesh out these characters and these storylines where they do kind of fill the gaps and make it a lot more fulfilling. But if you don't have a predestination of a trilogy or a movie series, it does seem like a little money grabby, you know, with star Wars, it's like, it's, it's really based around like this 30 year thing. The galactic empire was like a 30 year run in the entire timeline. Like if you think about us, there's 2000 years ago, completely different stuff was going on. 50,000 years from now, completely different stuff is going on. We are so focused on this like 20 to 30 year time period and all the events that happened in it. It's insane. You can go so much farther, but just to make a quick comparison, like Marvel, I feel like started off here and has expanded to something fantastic. And now they're kind of going, they're exploding outwards in uncontrollably. Yeah. Where star Wars is like, okay, prequels here, sequels here, OG trilogy here. How did how did these connect? And then you're kind of filling in the gaps and you're you're bridging the trilogies and making it a lot more fleshed out because you have to hold yourself to those specific timelines and those specific events where Marvel's just like, okay, we're just gonna kind of like expand Keep out going into the just, future. Just kind of big yeah. we're just gonna kind of big bang it. And at Marvel's going outwards and Star Wars is coming inwards. So I kind of like Star Wars a little bit more right now, even though I do love Marvel. I, I agree with you. I like what they're doing as far as taking established characters and flushing them out. You know, the, the tough thing for Star Wars and like very hardcore Star Wars fans is that there's, as everybody knows, there, there were series of books written, which have basically been thrown out from the canon. 
it's been categorized as Star Wars legend. Yeah, you know how upset I'd be if I was a huge Star Wars fan. I invested so much time in the books, and then I was basically told this never happened. <laughs> I'd be pissed. Well, yeah. I mean, I think the glass half full measure there is, hey, I know information other people don't, and maybe they'll adapt this. Because they do kind of do that with certain comic book runs and kind of say like, oh, you know what? Actually, we can make this work, and we can make this canon. Yeah. I'm not a big reader, so I don't have that problem. Boom. Don't read. You won't be disappointed. Last thing I'll say is I know uh, if you have a plan to do it, I think you're right, James. I think it makes sense to try to take advantage of as many mediums as you can to allow people to enter the universe, right? Maybe the first thing so a, a kid has seen is Mandalorian. Now I need to expand. DC Comics is doing this. James Gunn is now at the head of, of DC. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of throwing everything out the window and starting fresh created this whole new timeline and he has it it consists of movies animated shows and live action shows and they're all going to work together basically what disney's doing they want to do the same thing yeah and so it's basically like hey this character we can't afford to do this but we'll have an animated version of this what sucks is kind of you finally get a guy with a plan right say feloni right finally guy with a plan love feloni now you have to make up for and why feloni wasn't in charge of the sequels yeah, it's because he, he wasn't a J.J. Abrams or a, a Ryan Johnson. It's upsetting to me, but it sucks because now like James Gunn has to come into D.C. and look at the mess they've made over the last 10 years and go, oh, shit. Yep. <laughs> I have so much work to do. We've like Warner Brothers has invested so much money into like Wonder Woman 1984. And now I completely <laughs> got to get rid of this Wonder Woman. And, cre- and so like it's like I can't keep these characters, but they have so much money invested in these characters. And so they're just in this whole purgatory, but luckily it's it's just good to see Star Wars starting to get some consistency and just creative vision and fans behind the camera. And they're getting a new fan base who is along for the ride and is not as critical of. They're keeping it going. Yeah, X Y Z. So let's talk about that critical X Y Z, James. I think it's time for us to jump into our uh, final review. Final review. Fight. So we're going to get into what the other guys are saying, which is a little shocking. Or is it? Yes. So Rotten Tomatoes, the tomato meter, has it all the way down in the 18%. I really didn't see that coming. The audience for Rotten Tomatoes has it as a a 40, which is better, but still not great. Metacritic has it as a 35 out of 100. The Metacritic audience has it at a 5.6. And then IMDb... The highest score. The highest score is a 5.9. I I do think it just kind of goes with those stingy fans who This is my issue. Like, this isn't Star, Star Wars. Wars. This is a this is a kid's movie and this is bullshit. And this is and I mean to their point, it is, like I said, a long ass episode of a Clone Wars story arc in a movie format released in theaters. So maybe back in two thousand eight, if I was a hardcore stick up my butt nerd, maybe I feel the same way, but I I watched this in the 2020s and I'm using it to fill gaps and and explore the lore more. So I don't have those strong feelings, but I do see where they're coming from. Yeah, I would assume there was a ton of people who went into this film thinking it was going to be a full story of one of the Clone Wars. Didn't know it was going to be part of a series afterwards. So this was all very much planned. I don't know if they marketed it poorly. It is a little like, you know, is this like a Star Wars for kids vibes because it's a cartoon? Yeah, I can see that. All right, I'll give this a sarcastic selling point here. Let's just say I'm Dave Filoni and I say, hey, I'm wearing my cowboy hat and I say, I want to give you a feature length pilot for an animated Star Wars show that will fix the prequels entirely. I don't know about entirely, but I appreciate your optimism. All right, we'll fix the prequels 99%. I said my sarcastic selling point is let's do a low budget cartoon Star Wars. Sweet. I love it. And Nick, I revealed my popcorn points and my laughable log line first last week. Will you do the honors of going first this week? I would love to. So I said, Jedi shenanigans ensue as the former Padawan gets himself a Padawan. But maybe they're more alike than they think. Almost like a buddy, buddy cop comedy kind of thing. Here. What will happen next? Whoa, I gave it a 6.1. It's right up there in the Star Wars universe. The reason it gets dinged down to the six is uh, there's really it's not it's not a movie per se. Like without the series, this would be 
very bad. So it does get a little bit of credit because knowing that the, the series was coming after it, I'm not reviewing it based on how good the series was, but just knowing, okay, there was a plan after this, at least it's, it's just, an, it's a quick star Wars adventure over the course of an hour and a half, uh, which is fine. It's good enough for a, a 6.1. I, I don't, I, it's my issue with star Wars fans, not just star Wars fans with any large fan base, of any sort, whether it's in movies or music or sports. But, you know, if you talk to the guy who thinks every Beatles song is a is a platinum hit, at a certain point, you, there has to be realistic expectations for what's being put in front of you. And so I, I just don't feel that way with a lot of Star Wars fans. So I think this was really unnecessarily bashed by the critics and the people when it came out. I, maybe there was just still a lot of animosity coming off of Revenge of the Sith, because that was hated by fans and maybe they were just ready to hate the next thing that came their way. Yeah. They just had, watching. they just had their, eye, they were just seeing red that they, they were smelling blood and they just, they wanted to kill it. But 6.1 from your boy. My laughable log line is Anakin Skywalker and his pesky new Padawan, Ahsoka Tano find themselves recovering and babysitting a booger baby that belongs to Jabba the Hutt. 7.0 popcorn points. Like I touched upon earlier, it just does feel like a dragged out episode of Clone Wars. I feel like it could have been a lot shorter. Uh, Maybe it needed a little bit better pacing and progression of the relationship between Ahsoka and Anakin throughout the movie. Uh, Just give me a little bit more push-pull with the ideologies rather than the sass exchanges. Um, Because essentially, it's it's one long episode of Clone Wars. But with that said... It does give us some insight to what the Clone Wars will have in store, which is a way better version of Anakin Skywalker and how he handles a Padawan and how we can see he is going to be a different master than his old master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah, I was going to say there's a fun little exchange at the end where Anakin's talking to Ahsoka and says, you'd you'd never cut it as master. Oh, it's in the beginning. It's in the beginning. You're reckless, little one. You never would have made it as Obi-Wan's Padawan. But you might make it as mine. And then also in the beginning, Obi-Wan's talking to Yoda and he's saying, oh, I don't know if Anakin's ready for a Padawan. And Yoda's basically like, he is ready. It'll be letting go. That will be the challenge for him. Yes. Which is a, which is a conflict for Anakin because one of his major Jedi downfalls is that he grows attachments. Um, That's what happens with Padme. Happy with his mom. And then as we know that you can't like if you're a Jedi, it's kind of like being a monk. Can't really have any uh, relationships, no distractions. You got to focus on your honorable mission at hand. When Yoda said that to Obi-Wan, it was kind of funny because he was saying that about Anakin and he was kind of saying it to Obi-Wan as well, which is you have to let him be his own teacher. Because Obi-Wan obviously does wants Anakin to teach Ahsoka the way Obi-Wan would. And so Yoda's kind of saying to both of them, like, you guys need a little distance from each other to grow. It, and it, it creates very good dynamics throughout the course of the series. Again, we're, the series is really good. Couldn't recommend it more. I highly recommend watching The Clone Wars. Um, and to wrap up just my final thoughts on this, you just get a taste of what's to come. And at the end of the day, I, I'm i in. I, I'm, I'm sold. It could have been done a little bit more condensed and concise. Of course. Uh, was the animation a little bit, I don't want to say prehistoric, but it was in the early days of CGI becoming the common replacement for two-dimensional drawing cartoons for TV and movies. It's a little, you know, it's a little not refined, but as the season and the, or as the series progresses, the animation looks great. The Bad Batch right now is fantastic. The cinematography, the lighting, the graphics, it's, they keep the same art style, which I like. The character design. It's and just like the, cleaner. Like Rebels is cleaner and then Bad Batch now. Yeah. Rebels is a little bit, I, I call it Lego-y. I feel like they're a little bit more roundy in the head. Their movement's a little funky too. Yeah. And the, it was a little bit more Disney-ish. And then where the Clone Wars is a little bit more Cartoon Network-ish because that's where it premiered. Mm-hmm. They're a little bit more pointy and exaggerated facial features. I love it. You know, so at the end of the day, this is a 7.0 from me, which is... Just my, this is a good movie. I would rewatch it. Um, it's a fantastic, no, but I do like it at some capacity. Room for improvement. I have a question for you that I'm thinking about now. Mm-hmm. Do you think the series would have had the success that it had 
if it didn't start with a theatrical release. Oh, yeah. I don't think it would have had as much of a... Because this was a successful theatrical release that really put it on the map. Not according to the critics. But according to... It, it let people know about it, right? Like as a marketing tool. Do you think if it just started showing up on Cartoon Network, if do you think that Star Wars fans would have just gravitated to Cartoon Network to watch this? Like you said, I, I'm not sure if they would. Like you said earlier, if it doesn't matter the animation or the the medium, if you give me a good story, I will watch. And Clone Wars episodes. But if you give don't you know clues, about it, well, get to know. That's about what it. I'm saying. Get to know about it. Start something. Start something new. Get your toes. But, yeah, wet. all I'm saying is like, would would adult Star Wars fans go look on Cartoon Network to see what Star Wars show is on, or would you just discount it? You're like, it's a Cartoon Network show. Nah. Uh, if they're real fans, they would go check it out. Boom, roasted fans. Anyway, that is our review of Star Wars, The Clone Wars, and hopefully we get to dive into more Star Wars properties in the future. I know we kind of focus on obscure movies from the 80s and the 2000s, but you know, maybe occasionally we'll surprise you with a big franchise entry in a cinematic universe. Please join us next week when we review another box office bomb that I believe must have to do with pirates based on this title. I don't know, but I'm so excited to find out. (laughs) I'm so ready for it. Thank you guys so much for listening. Nick, let's get out of here. We're heading gone. Thank you for listening. Happy Star Wars week, unofficially, by the Just Play Podcast. May the fourth be with you. May the fourth be with you. May the third not be a turd. Be with you as well. May all your days be with you. And we'll see you next week. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Yar. Yarly-luya. Yar.